Um, will be from Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. And I'll be reading from the uh, New American Standard. And he summoned the multitude with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel shall save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And I also wish you a very good morning this morning. Great to be able to be here together today. Uh, Appreciate the enthusiasm of the songs that we've sung as uh, all of these have a very direct correlation. Every song that we've sung today, including the invitation song a little later to everything that we're going to be talking about in this morning's lesson. Uh, that song that I've been singing since I was a child, in fact, all of these, I was talking to, to Brother Ken Garrison earlier about some of the old standards, and these, a lot of these were old standard songs. But, uh, you know, in the old Red Book, in the old Sacred Selections, in this Yield Not to Temptation, it had beautiful harmony for the tenor and the bass, and it's all rested in the first of it, but a few of us remember where those notes were. And so we're going ahead and singing them anyway. <laughs> but um, really beautiful, beautiful songs. We're glad that you're here. And we do have some guests with us, guests from other parts of the, the state. We have some guests from our own locality. And we are so appreciative that you've taken the time to come and worship with us. As we're going to talk about following Jesus, following the steps of Jesus and all that that entails, it's something very interesting because I think that as Christians, it is something that we think about a lot. Uh, We talk about it, we think about it, we pray about it, we sing about it, and we even try to visualize ourselves, I suppose, in the sandals of those early disciples who walked and talked with Jesus and were eyewitnesses of his majesty and his magnificence. We're very blessed that we have the word of God that portrays that. But I do believe there would have been something very special to have been there too, to have seen him, to have walked with him, to have talked with him. But what Jesus wanted, more than people just witnessing him or saying that they knew him, is that Jesus called people to follow him. And all that that really means. To follow Jesus. And he continues to call people to follow him. In the reading that our brother Mark did for us, out of Mark chapter 8, Jesus shows that in following him, that is in being a disciple of Christ, requires a dedication, it's a commitment. And in that reading that we had, he even poses the question, what is a prophet in an individual if you would gain the whole world, if that was even possible, but lose your own soul? Because there is nothing more important than following the steps of Jesus. And so as he calls upon people to become disciples, he wants them to understand that as important as it is, it is challenging, and it does require a commitment and devotion. It is not something that we can just casually do, not casually follow Jesus. But then there's another important consideration in all of this. And it asks the question, where will the steps of Jesus take us? If we're going to truly follow his steps, truly follow Jesus, where will the steps of Jesus, by looking at his life, analyzing his life as it is portrayed in Scripture, Where will those steps take us, and are we really willing to go there? Most of you remember the expression, the phrase from years ago. It was popular for a while. It was, be careful what you ask for. 
you might get it. And there were times that people said, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But then remember, excuses though came up. But first let me do this or that. Bury my father or say farewell to some people that we were entertaining. And Jesus made it crystal clear that in following him, that means we must put him first and understand where that will take you. I've posed this question many times before. Tell me about the home or the property or the real estate of Jesus. Tell me about his house. Tell me about his material goods. About his wealth. And as you begin to think about that and look at Scripture, we know that he didn't even at times have a place where to lay his head. But like a prophet, at times a, a stone was his pillow. And so when people say that I'm going to follow Jesus, wherever you go, Jesus, you've got to understand where those steps will take you. And again, this is not a nonchalant or casual enterprise in which we are engaged. While we all definitely want to go to heaven one day, the steps of Jesus will escort us to many essential places before we reach that ultimate destination, heaven. And we must be willing to follow his steps, but what is this all about? Following Jesus. And while I'm not going to give to you a full exhaustive list of what we could talk about, and that we could do a multifaceted sermon, we're going to consider a few of those uh, points that are very important that I just want to highlight today in our short time together. And the very first thing that I think about, because of even before Jesus would inaugurate his own ministry, his own teaching and preaching of some three, three and a half years, I'll tell you when you follow the steps of Jesus, what we even see immediately in the ministry of Jesus, uh, uh, we follow the steps of Jesus and it's going to take you to the banks of the, the Jordan River. It's going to take you to the banks of the river. I want you to turn over to Matthew chapter 3 and notice with me. In Matthew chapter 3, beginning of verse 13, and Matthew puts with, within this text, in the narrative. In verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him. Here's John the Baptist. And he tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him, that is, upon Christ. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The question becomes, why was Jesus baptized? How much sin had Jesus committed? None. Sinless. But Jesus came to this earth, and when he came to this world as a man, he came to this earth, by the way, at what nationality? As a Jew, the children of Israel. Who's the prophet that preceded Jesus that was preparing the way is the very John the Baptist spoken of here in Matthew 3, correct? And as John the Baptist was preparing the way for Jesus, who would begin his own ministry, God had commissioned John to go to the Jewish nation, to the people of Israel, a nation that was badly in need of repentance. And he says, you have the people of Israel, they are to be baptized. And we know that according to Mark chapter 1 and verse 4, that this was God's righteous commandment. In fact, in Mark 1, 4, it says, John came baptizing in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. But this was the righteous requirement of God towards the people of Israel. Now, we understand that Jesus had no sin. He made no mistakes. He is sinless. But here he is as a Jew. He's of the tribe of Judah. He's within the nation of the family of Israel. And what would that look like if he did not obey the righteous commandment of God that was given to them? So we see, number one, he is fulfilling the righteous requirement of God, is he not? 
to Israel. And number two, is he not setting forth then a good example? Absolutely. He says, and, and we know John, John the Baptist looks at this and John knows who Jesus is. And wouldn't we feel the same way? If we're in that situation, and we know because John's a prophet, he knows who Jesus is. And Jesus says, John, I want you to baptize me. And John says, wait a minute, this ought to be the other way around. It seems to me you should be baptizing me. And that makes sense to us, doesn't it? He says, but to fulfill all righteousness, this is what's got to be done to fulfill the righteous requirement of God. And so he allowed him and he was baptized. And then the Spirit of God descends upon Jesus and the announcement comes from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And Jesus has fulfilled that requirement. And Jesus is getting ready. And he's readying himself for ministry. I want to tell you, we need to follow the steps of Jesus Simply by virtue of his example. We're not under the baptism of John today, but are we to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins? And if Jesus in his own example showed the importance that you fulfill the righteous requirement of law of God, that while we are under this now, the gospel of Jesus Christ, didn't Jesus commission his apostles in Matthew 28 and Mark 16 to do what? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. In Matthew 28, he says, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I have commanded you, and law will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And this is what they did. This is exactly what they did. And then when we come to the book of Acts, it should say Acts chapter 2, an obvious little typo there if you're following along in the outline. But in Acts chapter 2, when Peter preaches the first gospel sermon, and in verse 37, and they say, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now Jesus has died, he was buried, he's been resurrected, he was ascended back up into heaven, seated at the right hand of God. The gospel was being preached, they said, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it says that in verse 41 that those that gladly received the word were baptized. I'll tell you what, that when you follow the steps of Jesus, the steps of Jesus, if you're going to truly follow the steps, they're going to take you to a water source. It may be a river, it may be an ocean. I have baptized people in, 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 in saunas and hot tubs at the fields. We did many baptisms there. I've baptized people at Montana de Oro, a Coleman Beach in Morro Bay. Bob Hurtles was insistent on that. I've baptized people in a lot of different places in plastic laundry carts at California Men's Colony. But whatever it is, when you follow the steps of Jesus, it's going to take you to baptism. You've got to, and that is a part of the righteous requirement of God under the gospel of Jesus Christ. When Philip did his preaching in Samaria in Acts 8, 12, that men and women believed the preaching of Philip and the things concerning the kingdom of God, and they were baptized, both men and women. There we see it in Acts chapter 8. Then we see a little bit later in chapter 8, that when Philip then goes to the Gaza desert, and there's the Ethiopian eunuch who's reading from Isaiah 53 about the suffering Messiah. He didn't understand who he was who the prophet was talking about. But Philip the preacher says, he begins at that passage, he begins at Isaiah 53, and he preached to him Jesus. And when they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And he said, see here is water. What here is me from being baptized? And he says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I'm going to tell you, following the steps of Jesus is going to take you to the waters of baptism. And we look at example after example. And the book of Acts. And we go to Galatians chapter 3. And what does Paul remind the Christians there in Galatians 3.26? He reminds those Christians, you're all the sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For, it's very positive, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If you want to put on Christ, which is really following his steps, you're going to be baptized into Christ. And furthermore, the apostle Peter correlates it directly to salvation. When he gives his analogy in 1 Peter chapter 3, 20 and 28... When he talks about in the days of Noah that eight souls were saved by water. And in verse 21, corresponding to that or like in like manner, baptism does now save us. To follow the steps of Jesus. Yes, we have to understand who Christ is, that he is the son of God. And that we must acknowledge that in faith. And yes, we must repent of those past sins, as Peter said in Acts 2.38. But we are going to be baptized into Christ. That's what following Jesus 
is all about in our getting started on this wonderful journey. Have you done that? Have you truly done that? Was it your choice, your decision, um, based on your faith, your repentance, and your desire to be immersed for the remission of sins into Jesus Christ, following the steps of Jesus? Now, once we've done that, we understand that even after Jesus was baptized in Matthew 3, then what immediately did he do after his baptism? He went into the wilderness by himself and he fasted for 40 days. And that takes us to the wilderness of temptation. And following the steps of Jesus, following Jesus through times of temptation, Jesus showed us how to deal with that as well. Take your Bibles and now turn over to Matthew chapter 4, would you? In Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, the scripture says, Then Jesus was led up. Matthew 4 and verse 1. Now Matthew says in this narrative, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And a tempter came to him. This is the devil, Satan, because he's going to identify. But the tempter came to him saying, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, that's Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle, the highest place of the temple, and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, and now Satan's going to quote some scripture. He will command his angels concerning you, Jesus, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. But then Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him now to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, the devil says to Jesus, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Has Jesus taught us how to deal with temptation? And following the steps of Jesus, and when we do that according to his word, those steps will take us right through times of temptation. Because we continue to be tempted. And that was not the last temptation of Jesus. There were many other times of which the devil tried to do what he could to try Jesus, to tempt Jesus. But there's so many valuable points that we get from this. And we even know that as John outlined in 1 John chapter 2, and we'll go to this again in a minute, but in verses 15 and 16, but verse 16, remember there John says, here's all that the world has to offer. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We sometimes refer to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life as what? The three avenues of temptation. That every temptation imaginable, it will fall into the, one of those categories and sometimes a combination there too. But the lust of the flesh, those fleshly, natural, physical desires that we have that are inordinately wrong. The lust of the eyes, that which is so appealing to the sense of what we see and now what we want. And the pride of life, vainglory or arrogance. And every sin you can think of is going to fall in one of those three categories. And I want to ask you, when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness and he's in a weakened condition. He, hadn't, he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He is weak, he is tired, he is alone. And does Satan know how and when to approach people? Not at the times that they're with their, their good friends and brethren necessarily, or not in, in, in times of their strength, but I'll tell you what, he wants to try to tempt people when they are most vulnerable. Do you hear me? And he certainly tempted Jesus through the lust of the flesh. If you're the son of God, command these stones to be turned into bread. And what does Jesus do? He says, it's written. And he quotes verbatim Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. 
Then he appeals to the pride of life, take him on the pinnacle of the temple. Throw yourself down, because look what will happen. The people down in the courtyard, you'll become falling down from that high place, and the angels will come swooping in, and they'll spare you and save you, and the people will go, wow. But what does Jesus do again? He says to him, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test, as he quotes verbatim, Deuteronomy 6.16. The devil's not done. And he takes him to this high mountain and he shows him in panoramic fashion all of the kings of the world. And he says, fall down and worship me. If you fall down, he says, I will give you all these things, all these kingdoms. And once again, Jesus says, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God in him. Only you shall serve, which is from Deuteronomy 6.13 and found again in correlation of chapter 10 and verse 20. Did Jesus teach us how to deal with temptation? When we follow the steps of Jesus, and when you follow the steps, it will get us through temptation. It will get you through temptation. And the, the answer to it is what? I'll tell you what. The power of God's word to begin with. That's why we need to know God's word. That's why it needs to be written in our hearts. That's why it needs to be a real and applicable and practical in our lives. That's the answer. Follow the steps of Jesus. Now we go back to 1 John that I alluded to very briefly a moment ago, but that's why the Apostle John said in 1 John 2 and verse 15, he says, Do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world. For if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God abides forever. The answer is God's word, and we must do everything that we can that we might be able to get through these times of temptation. All of us. And we're tempted in a variety of ways, but I'll tell you one thing we know that Scripture says is temptation common to all. In 1 Corinthians, what does Paul say to the Corinthian brethren? In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, first of us says, when a man thinks he stands, what? Take heed, lest he fall. That we can become filled with, with pride or arrogance and are thinking, you know what, I'm untouchable and I've reached a level of faith and spot where the, the devil can't touch me. I want to tell you, be, be very careful with that. When a man thinks he stands, take head, he lest he fall. But what is he going to say in verse number 13? He says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. Somebody says, but you know what? I have to deal with things in my life that nobody else has ever had to do. And this is something that I just can't deal with. And Paul says, no. No, it's not true. Temptation is common to man, but he continues. But God is faithful. I just preached last Sunday night the faithfulness of God. God is faithful. You can depend upon him. He's trustworthy. You can rely upon him at all times. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. If we follow the steps of Jesus, can we get through temptation? But you've got to follow the steps. Follow the steps of Jesus. Jesus showed us the importance of going to the water. And Jesus has shown us the importance to appealing to God's word even when we deal with temptation on a daily basis. And I'm talking about even us as Christians after we were baptized. Because though we were baptized in Christ, and for some it was a matter of weeks or months ago, some had come in years ago or decades ago, but I want to ask all of you and all of us, does temptation still continue to be a problem? Yes, we've got to get through that. And the only way we get through that is by following the steps of Jesus. Now we do that and we understand the importance and the strength of discipleship. Now I'll tell you what else we need to do in following the steps of Jesus. so important. Following Jesus, he wants to take us on a fishing expedition. We have a few people here that love to go fishing. And, and, and you know what, with you, I love it when you go fishing. The Owens are just, oh, those Owens are so great. They go fishing. They go north of Cayucas and their kayaks out there in the kelp beds and so forth. And they hit those rockfish. And, and, and they call and they say, Brent, we've got a bunch of, and I mean, they're cleaned, they're boned, they're skinned and boned. And he says, Brent, I've got this beautiful, fresh fish. Would you like some? I said, let me think about it. Yes. And mom and dad like it too because they say we're having a fish fry. And I'll tell you, but I'll tell you what Jesus wants to do. He wants to take us on a fishing expedition. 
You know, in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus begins to call his disciples, these men that who had become apostles, as a matter of fact, but in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18, beginning Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. Matthew 4 and verse 18. And he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, in verse 22, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. He calls these men, yes, to be disciples. He's going to call them even to be apostles, which means they're going to be sent out to preach. But I tell you what, he says, I want to make you fishers of men. Following and fishing, following and fishing. It is so important. And that's what Luke 19, excuse me, verse 19 is all about. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And I tell you what, in so many ways, a lot of us can become fishermen too. In our way, in our time, and in our opportunity. That we have opportunities that we can do some fishing. That's not always easy. In fact, I love the old quote. That, that is given if fishing were easy, it would be called catching, and everybody else would be doing it too. It's not always easy. And sometimes you're tired and you don't want to do it. Remember the account that we have in, in Luke chapter 5 and the disciples that these fishing partners that we just read about, here's the account where they've been fishing all night and they come in. Jesus comes out to him, he says, and he gets on, he says, let's go out a little bit, go out a little bit. And he stands there not far from the shore and he begins to do some preaching and teaching. And he finishes that and then he says, let's go out a little farther. And they go a little farther. He says, now cast your net over on the other side. And Peter, who's the professional fisherman, he says, Lord, we've been toiling, working all night and caught nothing. And Peter, I'll tell you, Peter knew about fishing. He says, you know what? This is not happening today. He says, but nevertheless, at your word, I will do it. Now, there's a lesson right there, right? Nevertheless, at your word, I'll do it. And he cast it on the other side. And what happened? That net became so filled with fish that the boat began to sink. And there's a lot of lessons that we can learn. But I'll tell you, one of the lessons is this. If we'll just make the effort, the sincere, concerted, diligent, tireless effort, I believe God will bring in the produce or the fish. And even when you're tired, we're tired, we've labored all night. Follow the steps of Jesus. And it will take you on a fishing expedition. And so many of you know the story of the conversion of my father. And he was laid up and couldn't really go anywhere. We're living on Titus Point right there in, in Cambria. And Brother Louis Stout could come and just, he could fish off our backyard. And he did. But when he came to do that, and we asked my mother's permission, I tell you what, he wasn't interested in perch. He was interested in Dow J. Willie. And he went fishing for men, Brother Stout did. And he snagged a good one. Follow the steps of Jesus. Even in the proverbial wisdom of Proverbs 11 verse 30, Solomon says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. We need to be wise and go on this fishing expedition and bring souls to Christ. Follow the steps of Jesus. I want to suggest to you that following Jesus, though, that when we think about what our life is all about, and yes, we follow him to, to that water of baptism, and we follow him so we can get through the wilderness, our own wilderness of temptation, and we follow him and trying to be example and take every advantage of every opportunity to bring other people to Christ because souls are precious. But I'll tell you, when you truly follow the steps of Jesus, the steps of Jesus are going to take you to a cross, even as it took him to the cross of Calvary. Jesus was taken to the hill of Calvary. When you look at the text in Luke chapter 23, it is very, these are kinds of passages that they're very painful to read, to consider, to meditate upon, and yet they're so important. In Luke 23, in beginning of verse 26, Luke writes, Now as they led him, that's Jesus, away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon the Cyrenian, who is coming from the country, and on him, they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Jesus had carried that cross as long as he possibly humanly, physically could. You've got to understand that at this point, Jesus has already been beaten to a bloody pulp. The loss of blood and the loss of other body fluids and hydration that had just left his body 
as he, again, was beaten so badly and was so weakened and his flesh and his muscles were torn. And as there are all kinds of medical things going on and as he couldn't, he could no longer take it up that they finally take this cross and put it on this Simon only to have Jesus still go up and trudge up that hill to be later nailed to that cross. In verse 27, a great multitude of the people followed him and women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus turning them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for the children, for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, wombs that never bore, and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. Why would he say that? Because he knew that what was there was a wicked generation, a nation of people that rejected God would reject him, and judgment was coming. And it would be too late that when this judgment comes upon many of these people, it's just going to be too late and they're going to be so sorrowful and, and what he's saying to them you're weeping for me and you see my blooded condition of what I'm going through and what I'm going to go through but I'll tell you what you need to do this is what Jesus is saying you need to take a good look at yourself because if you don't correct things what's going to result condemnation eternal verse 31 for if they do these things in the greenwood what will be done in the dry? I'll tell you, good, bad, no matter what your circumstance may be. There were also two others, criminals, led with them to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, the place of the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Oh, well, we know that Jesus was given a crown, but that was sadistically given that crown of thorns. Would Jesus in time receive both a victory crown but also the diadema, not only the Stephanos, the victory crown, but the diadema that he would be crowned as king of kings? But before Jesus could receive the crown, there had to be the cross. The cross came before the crown. And I know one day we all would like to have that crown of everlasting life, would we not? The crown that Paul speaks of in 2 Timothy 4. The crown that is spoken of numerous times in the book of Revelation. But I'll tell you before the crown, there has to be a cross. Jesus did it. And I'll tell you right now, Jesus took it. Everything they did, everything as we would say in our common vernacular, everything they dished out, he took it and he did not retaliate. Though he could have. Could he have called for 12 legions, or that is more than 10,000 angels? Could he have called them and to eradicate the wicked generation that was doing this to him? The Apostle Peter deals with this very effectively in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. And in 1 Peter 2, 21, he says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed, were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. He didn't revile. He did not retaliate. He took it. And I'll tell you what, we need to learn to take it as well. Follow the steps of Jesus. Jesus said in, nine, in Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9 verse 23, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's following Jesus. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul would later say in Galatians chapter 2 and in verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, yet it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He was crucified with Christ. Remember what he 
reminded Timothy right before Paul was executed and Paul, as he was beheaded for the cause of Christ. But here's what Paul wrote to Timothy right before, months before his execution. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, he says, Yes, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And when people are looking for convenient Christianity or convenient discipleship, they do not know what they're asking. And finally, the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14. If you're reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed. Because the spirit of glory and God rest upon you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, thief, an evildoer, a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed but to glorify God in this name. Follow the steps of Jesus and be ready to go to a cross or to a place or a time of suffering. But if we do all of that in following Jesus, and so many other things we could have talked about, but in following Jesus, and if we would truly follow Jesus as according to his word, following Jesus to an eternal home in heaven. And brethren, I want to tell you right now, and, 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 and the comment was made in Bible class this morning, and it's just all over scripture, and the comment was made at the Lord's table today, and the final analysis, and made this point, and in, in our Bible class up in Cambria yesterday, in the final analysis, when everything is looked at, what is most important and what do we really want? What is it we really want? Salvation, we want to go to heaven. And you've got to follow the steps of Jesus and you'll take your right to an eternal home in heaven. We know that Jesus went back to heaven. We read about his ascension. His ministry is complete. He died. He was buried. He was resurrected. And now he's ready to send back into heaven as we see in Luke 24. And he takes the, his apostles. He takes the disciples, excluding Judas Iscariot, who's now dead. But he takes the others and he goes out as far as Bethany, right outside of Jerusalem. And he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Luke 24 and verse 52 says, And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. And when Luke finishes that, sometime later on, he writes a second letter to Theophilus. That's who he wrote the book of Luke to. Now he writes a second letter and it's called the book of Acts. And he picks up with that again in Acts chapter 1 and verse 9. And there Luke says, now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like matter as you saw him go into heaven. And what do the scriptures tell us? We don't know when that's going to be. But when Christ comes again, the dead in Christ can be raised up. We who are alive and remain will be immediately caught up together with them in the clouds. And show, shall we ever be with the Lord? That's what 1 Thessalonians 4 teaches. That we're going to be going into eternal home in heaven. But you've got to follow the steps of Jesus. Where is Jesus right now? You see, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Is he not? A couple of quick passages in the book of Hebrews that really illustrates that. In Hebrews 8.1. Now this is the main point of the things which you are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne, the majesty in the heavens. Our high priest is Jesus Christ. You will go on to chapter 10 and verse 12. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We know where Jesus is. And what has he done? And what is he doing? Is he preparing a place for us to be with him for eternity? Absolutely. What a beautiful, beautiful verse in John 14. So many people love this passage read at certain times, even for funerals. I understand that. But in John 14, Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. And remember what Thomas asked him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Are you following the steps of Jesus? And the steps of Jesus will give you to that home that has been promised. That is our hope, a hope of heaven. That Paul said in Colossians 1.5, because of the hope which is laid up in heaven for you, which Peter called in 1 Peter 1.3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Follow the steps of Jesus. So much more we could say. But I think that's plenty for this morning. And a lot of scriptures to really think about. But Jesus calls us to follow his steps. That we one day will go to heaven. Will we come? Will we follow? Will we do what it takes? I have tried to outline the saving message and even the saving gospel of Jesus Christ this morning. And if you realize what you must do and what you must acknowledge, then we're here to assist you, whatever that need may be. Let that be known. But let none of us walk out these doors today without making that commitment of following the steps of Jesus. If we can assist you, won't you come at this time as we stand and sing the song that has been selected.